follow the signs Watch them fall down Only in love Only in love I've been playing about 25 years Yeah, so And um, I started quite late But Yeah, I don't read music I just listen to it, do it by ear So uh, And then I find all these strange chords and people say, what's that chord? I say, I don't know. So I have to get them to tell me what it is. I've just done like a 10th album, so. And I did some band albums as well. So in total, probably about 14 albums. Obviously the weather's great. The people, the foods, just the atmosphere of Asia, I love it. I mean, I've been coming to Asia for a number of years and singing for my supper. So yeah, I'm enchanted with the place, I think. I went to Germany when I was 18 with my guitar and, um, and sort of started travelling around and then I worked in with an American theatre company and did some theatre. So that's where it all really started and then I did bands and different things, travelled all over Europe, uh, eventually uh, lived in the Channel Islands and then came back to, to London and got a band together and then sort of different projects, duos, trios, recorded albums, did some radio stuff. Um, yeah, a mixture really. And that's taken me probably to 35 different countries around the world. So in October 2005, me and 14 other guys, we broke the record for the world's highest gig. Um, we went above base camp, 5,400 meters, uh, which was a really cool thing to do because we not only did we get the, the, the Guinness World Record for the World's Highest Gig, we also raised 30,000 pounds for Nepalese children, and we built an orphanage outside Kathmandu. For the gig, we had to get up like four o'clock in the morning, and um, so um, we're climbing the last leg, and I, I go to get my my water bottle, and it's like a solid block of ice. It's just like. It's that cold. But actually when we got to the summit, the sun came out and I thought I couldn't play because it was going to be too cold to play. But it was, it was great. And what was really nice was we were, like, we were looking down and all these people were coming up. And we had to get up like three, four o'clock in the morning to get to the summit by eight, eight o'clock. It was the last leg. And seeing all these people coming, they'd come to see us play. They all got up and made the effort. So that was a really good buzz, you know, I'm singing, I can see all these people coming up the mountain. And it was, it was kind of special, you know, a special moment in my life to, to experience that, you know, because it's not an easy thing to do, you know, because the altitude sickness affects you. So, um, yeah, there was, uh, there was moments, everyone had their little moment of, of kind of uh, uh, struggle, their struggle with themselves to face their demons and stuff. So including me, the feeling of, of, of it never being quite 100% there. It's all on the edge, yeah. So after we did the world's highest gig, we came down and, and, and I was first on stage, which was like, oh my God, you know, there were 14, I think 14 or 15,000 maybe people there. There's all those people out there, and I've got to open the show, you know? So I'm like thinking, oh my God. So as I'm walking up the stairs, I see this Nepalese guy there who plays like the tabla. And I, we just have eye contact like this. And I go, do you want to come and join us? He said, yeah, why not? So I thought, if I, at least if I have like a Nepalese guy on stage with me, with this big crowd, there might be a chance that, you know, it's going to go okay, you know. So he just came up. We never played together before. And he played his tabla. My friend played electric guitar and I played acoustic guitar. And we did it. And it was cool. And everything went okay. But just in that split second, as I'm walking up the stairs, I managed to, you know, get, you know, pull in another musician. She wasn't shy.
it's got to flow. Every, the creative has got to flow. So you've got to allow the rubbish to come in as well as the good bits. And then, then you can find the, the gold. You know? I always think when I'm writing, it's like another me. It's not me. It's like another, another part of me. Because sometimes I'll sit down and write a song like, in 10, 15 minutes. And there'll be all these lyrics and all these emotions. And I think, well, where did that come from? You know, what was that? That's, that's, that's peculiar. What, you know? And that, but I've done it. But it's like another me, you know? So it's, it's like an alter ego kind of thing. I don't want to fight it, you know? You know, or question it or try and analyse it too much. Because if you do that, then you're going to stop, stop the flow, you know? You just let, if it's working, then just let it happen. But generally speaking, when I've been in Asia, I don't write in that period. But when I get back to England, then I, all these experiences, all these Asian experiences, then flow out of me. And the people I've met, and, the, and you know, the, just the, the different experiences, it all comes out like a big you know, out of a pot, bubbling out of a big pot. And then, and then the songs come from that. So it's, it's almost like, yeah, it's like my diary, but all, all sort of stacked in my subconscious somewhere. Like, you know, it's not all about my personal experiences. It's about experiences that other people have shared with me and bits of that. So I kind of tend to steal, I don't deliberately steal, but I, I kind of steal bits from lots of different things that happen really. Um, and that makes up a picture. It's a bit like you know, a jigsaw puzzle and throwing it all down and just picking the bits up and making the jigsaw and then hopefully making a, a song that, that people will you know, relate to and understand and enjoy it. You know. Well, I'm not sure about the truth anymore. But you're holding our well against your enemies from hell. If you uh, aspire to Buddhist philosophy, you're going to come around anyway. So everything's everything. You're going to be. Um, and if you think of it like that, then nothing's a problem, is it? Because you're just going to life is continuing, and you know it's just going around that circle of life. Thing. So um, I suppose when I was younger, I, I used to get like about certain things, and now I've, I've started to realise that it's just um, it's better to just go with the flow and take it easy and not try. But I'm, I'm a person, I'm a perfectionist. But it's very difficult for me to to chill and, and let that go, because I want to get things right. But at the same time, the other part of me is saying, no, 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 just be cool and um, let it happen. There's the logical and the emotional, um, and, and they're having a bit of a war. To let it pass by In the blink of an eye But now the crossroads is here to turn left or right So show me a sign Just to make things right But I don't want to say you're wrong But hope is so lonely when you're gone. You know what a Boy Scout is? So we used to learn how to do all the knots. So I, I thought I was never, I'm never going to use this in my life, you know. But actually, um, these, this is a reef knot. This, this knot's called a reef knot. So when I, when I was a Boy Scout, I was a patrol leader. So I was like, you know, the boss, you know, sort of thing. And I never thought that like these knots that I would learn would ever be useful but then when I discovered that I broke guitar strings I don't like the sound of a new guitar string I tie, end up tying a knot in the, in the string 
It's a Martin D41, and it's quite old. I bought it second hand when I was in Germany, and it's a 1976 Martin. You can see it's quite battered. You can see all this where I try to play drums on my guitar, uh, and all these little dents. But this has been amazing, this guitar. Um, you can see it's got some war damage part of um, the journey of all the songs so I had it set up by this uh, American guy and because my first guitar was a Japanese guitar and it, the action on it, it used to play like, like butter, it was so easy to play. And I thought all guitars were going to be like that, so I decided when I got enough money to buy an expensive guitar and bought this one. And it was really difficult to play, so I was so disappointed. And I took it to a guitar maker, I said, make it like that Japanese guitar. I want my Martin to play exactly the same as the Japanese guitar. And he spent hours on this guitar, filing this and cutting that. And I got it back and he said, does this play like your Japanese guitar? And I played it, I said, yeah, it does, and he said. Well, that's brilliant. Then I'm happy if you're happy. That's it. I like playing with musicians that just feel it, you know, and, uh, and I think you get that from struggle sometimes, you know, when you've been you know, not having money and slept on floors and things like that because it's an old cliche thing, but sometimes you have to go through some pain to get the game. But I quite like that, I like the fact you travel around, you meet someone, you don't really know them and just see what happens, just, you know, jump into the deep end and see if you're going to swim or drown. <laughs> For me, this is, this is uh, an amazing Humble yet positive, but still got a lot to learn. <laughs> it's my pleasure, and it's, I've been Billy Payne, and thank you so much. And what a wonderful location uh, in the middle of Saigon in the park, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Follow the signs Watch them fall down Only in love Only in love Stand up and shout For what you believe Only in love Only in love